morning and welcome to Business Morning. I'm Ladi Williams. And I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. Thank you for joining us. Well, the United Nations expects the global economy to recover by 4.7% this year after shrinking 4.3% in 2020 owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. In its World Economic Situation and Prospects report released yesterday, the United Nations also mentions that developing countries, which um, contracted by 2.5%, are estimated to grow by 5.7% in 2020. 2021. However, the UN report says the modest recovery expected within the year would barely offset the losses of 2020, as 131 million more people, especially women and children, have been pushed into poverty. Meanwhile, the UN warns that um, the devastating socio-economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic will be felt for years to come unless smart investments in economic societal and climate matters are made to ensure a robust and sustainable recovery. In the meantime, the United Nations says financial markets are big winners from the pandemic spending. According to the report, unprecedented fiscal and monetary support from governments to uh, counter the coronavirus pandemic has failed to boost investment in things like factories and industrial equipment uh, necessary to power job growth. The report says the biggest uh, benefits are flowing to financial markets, pushing uh, share prices higher. The report is the latest to signal a widening economic breach as the impact of the pandemic expands even with uh, vaccine distribution accelerating. The report says with growing fiscal deficits, total uh, public debt worldwide increased uh, by about $9.9 .9, uh, trillion in 2020. And on the global oil market, prices fell this morning as fading hopes for a rapid approval of new U.S. economic stimulus and mounting new coronavirus cases raised questions over the pace of any recovery in demand. Brent crude was down 28 cents at $55.60, while U.S. crude fell 25 cents to $52.52. .52. Both rose nearly 1% on Monday. Having recently hit 11-month high, oil is caught between lingering doubts over any recovery in demand as the pandemic continues to rage, offset by optimism for more stimulus from the newly installed Biden administration in the United States to support economic growth as vaccines are rolled out. Even as the pace of new infections falls in the United States, European nations have set tough restrictions to combat the spread of the virus, while China is reporting rising new COVID-19 cases, casting a pile over demand prospects in the world's largest energy consumer. Still, there are areas where demand for oil remains strong. In India, crude oil imports in December rose to their highest in more than two years as the easing of coronavirus restrictions boosted economic activity. On the supply side, the organization of the petroleum exporting countries and its allies' compliance with uh, pledged oil output curbs is averaging 85% in January. And uh, back here in the auto industry, Meccano Motors, a subsidiary of Meccano International Limited, has launched uh, two locally assembled uh, Emigrant 7 and uh, Geely X7 Sport into the Nigerian market. At the formal presentation in Lagos, the chairman of Meccano International, uh, Mofid Karame, said the partnership with Geely took three years and that the car manufacturer keeps investing funds to make world-class products. Do take a listen. First, it was a test drive to demonstrate the strength and resilience of the two new cars. The Meccano Geely M Grand 7 and M Grand X7 Sport. Now it's time for the formal introduction into the Nigerian market. In attendance at the occasion are the management and staff of Meccano Motors, supermodel Naomi Campbell, and Nigeria's Minister of Trade and Industry, Otsumbani Adebayo. The chairman of Meccano International explain the relationship between Mikano and the Geely brand. It takes us more than three years studying and looking around to find a brand where we can trust and bring into the country. The technology on Geely cars, there are so many. And the last technology, they have invested more than $400 million to fix a satellite just for the navigation system of this car, which will be operational in the next six months. Then it's time to leave the veil as the two new cars are presented. I'm very, very impressed. It uh, seems to combine 
all the qualities of uh, luxury cars that you find anywhere in the world. The whole idea is they will come in, assemble, and then from there, from the numbers that they assemble, it will encourage MSMEs, uh, SMEs to actually start producing the parts that they will be using to manufacture. The locally assembled Geely M Grand 7 is a classic car which is redefined. It's powered by a 1.5 litre engine and comes with a load of safety features which include the seatbelt reminder, overspeeding alarm device and anti-theft alarm device. The Geely M Grand X7 Sport is powered by a naturally aspirated 2.4 litre engine and boasts of a panoramic sunroof. It's also described as a melting point of technology, connectivity and superior aesthetics and comes at a pocket-friendly price. For the X7 Sport, we start, the price starts from 13.7 and the EC7 we start from 8.7. So it's all affordable for all the high-end quality with you have package as well. We have five years warranty or 150,000. The 27-year-old Meccano Group says it will keep providing premium quality products to the Nigerian market by building global strategic alliances with the world's largest manufacturers. Yeah, it's nice. interesting to know that there are cars <laughs> assembled here in Nigeria. How about having one of these cars? Yeah, the, the SUV should suit you just fine. Yeah. Are you going to give me one of them? Right, let's see how that goes. <laughs> 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 All right. The Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank ends today and the Central Bank Governor will be announcing the committee's decision later this afternoon by yeah. 2 p.m. to be precise. Now, the meeting, being the first in the new year, is coming amid a resurgent coronavirus infection globally, rising inflation, liquidity squeeze in foreign exchange market and poor growth trajectory. Mm -hmm. In 2020, the monetary policy re remained broadly accommodative. The NPR was uh, reduced twice in its May meeting and its September meeting. The Sierra was hiked in its January 2020 meeting. Now, these decisions, no doubt, had some implications for the economy and the financial system in particular. Victor Aluyi, Head Portfolio Management at Commercial Partners, joins us next. And uh, Victor Aluyi joins us now. Hello, Victor. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so ensuring uh, price stability is a core mandate of the CBN. Uh, how well would you say the Apex Bank has been able to achieve this objective, especially now that inflationary pl uh, pressures uh, have been mounting? Well, I think, um, you know, uh, if you look at what the uh, committee of the Apex Bank has done, at least over the last um, one year thereabouts, I think focus has been on, um, you know, sustaining output growth uh, by, you know, uh, putting up measures and uh, policy initiatives to ward off the uh, economic impact of the whole COVID-19 pandemic. And that's why we saw um, you know, that reduction in the benchmark rate twice last year to about 11.5%. We've also seen quite a number of policy initiatives aimed at reflating, um, you know, the economy. So I think the major focus for the committee has been um, output growth, uh, not necessarily at the expense of price stability. Um, you know, in a number of the communiques that we've seen or that we saw last year, uh, committee essentially alluded to the fact that, um, you know, inflationary pressures are essentially born out of, uh, you know, a, a lot of distortions, uh, you know, really to the supply chain. And um, those are not um, issues that can be readily addressed, you know, with monetary policy, hence the really strong focus on, um, on output growth. And if you look at the um, output growth number, um, we saw a semblance of, um, you know, some sort of recovery, if you will, although still negative growth, but um, uh, significantly softer than what we saw, um, you know, in Q2. So clearly, I, I think the focus of the Apex Bank continues to be uh, warding off the potential economic impact of the whole COVID-19 challenge and putting the economy on a path of uh, uh, recovery. So I, I think that has been the you know, major focus and concern, and I think would, uh, you know, continue to be uh, particularly with this uh, uh, maiden meeting of 2021. Now, okay, you, you don't uh, see the monetary policy tinkering with um, uh, any of the rates uh, at this meeting, particularly as we're seeing inflation uh, rate um, rising so badly. 
Because a lot of people, of course, uh, believe that with the rise in inflation uh, fit at over 15% now, uh, the central bank may probably, probably raise the NPR. Well, I think inflation really has become, you know, a concern. I was seeing the headline number for December almost at 16%. Uh, we still think that there's still some, you know, more pressure uh, on that food front and also on the core front as well. But I, I just like the, the, the committee had alluded, uh, you know, in, in about two of its meetings last year, uh, that inflationary pressure really uh, isn't necessarily born out of... Um, you know, monetary policy issues. They are essentially born out of um, supply chain disruption, disruptions that had been occasioned by the whole COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, so I think the expectation is that as the economy sort of opens back up, as, um, you know, supply chains recover, uh, the committee expects that we would see uh, some sort of um, amelioration in that number, if you will. Also recall that, um, you know, the border closure that we had um, late in 2019 and contributed in no little way, um, you know, in driving up that pressure that we had seen on, on the food front. Uh, so recall that um, sometime in December, there's been a policy uh, reversal, if you will, to sort of open up those borders. And we expect that, um, you know, the impact of that will probably kick in uh, sooner rather than later. So I, I think just from the posture or the body language of the committee, uh, we're likely to see a bit more concentration um, on output growth. Yes, we're, we're probably going to look to the committee for some sort of guidance on um, what it thinks and what it intends to do, particularly with respect to price stability. Um, really, that remains to be seen, uh, what the committee will do. And uh, one of the major functions of the CBN is to ensure financial uh, system stability. How stable is the financial system? And are we sure all our banks can uh, pass a stress test at this point? Well, I, I think that um, if you look at some of the metrics that the committee put out, particularly, you know, in its final meeting of last year, um, you know, liquidity ratio, um, you know, for the entire sector is still way above, uh, um, you know, uh, the regulatory threshold. Uh, we're seeing, um, you know, loan book expansion, albeit as a result of the uh, LDR policy. Uh, so clearly, I, I think that, you know, on, on its footing, the banking sector has shown uh, a decent amount of resilience. Um, however, we will probably like to see some, you know, some tests or stress tests test carried out by, um, you know, the Apex Bank to ascertain and determine, you know, the general and overall stability of the uh, of the banking sector. Now, Moody's, one of the world's um, leading sovereign credit rating agencies, and their comments recently on Nigeria's macroeconomic environment referred to very weak macro profile and um, difficult operating environment for banks. Uh, it raises serious concerns about banking sector vulnerability to systemic risks and exogenous um, shocks, especially an abrupt exchange rate adjustment. Now, with the banking, uh, Nigerian banking stocks soaring at very high levels. Now, what are the risks facing shareholders of banks in the current stock market rally? Well, I think that, you know, the, the stock market rally is, uh, you know, another story altogether, really. And it's basically being born out of the, you know, the search for yields. Um, you know, uh, if you look at what you've got in the fixed income market, uh, those yields had essentially fallen off a cliff, although we had seen some sort of adjustment towards the end of last year. So that, that um, you know, significantly low yield in the fixed income environment has, um, you know, forced investors to look for better yield elsewhere. And they found those in, um, you know, the banking sector, particularly from a dividend yield perspective. And that's the reason you're seeing, um, you know, investors essentially pile onto those names. Um, in terms of, you know, the general risk within the macro environment and how that could impact, um, you know, the banking sector, I, I think that uh, investors are more concerned about the sort of dividend payout that they are likely to see from the banking sector and uh, the sort of yield that that is likely to bring onto their portfolio. And that's the reason you're seeing, um, you know, investors pile on into, into those names. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the broad macro weakness, weakness really, that's, that's a given, uh, given the fact that we essentially have um, fallen into what you might describe as a double deep recession, really. 
Uh, and, and that's all on the back of the whole COVID-19 challenge. Uh, we, we believe that um, we're likely to see some sort of recovery towards the end of the first half of, uh, of this year, uh, given all of the policy initiatives, um, you know, the accommodative monetary policy, and also, um, you know, supportive policy initiatives from the Apex Bank and also the fiscal authorities. We think that all of these should come together to provide um, you know, some support to the overall macro economy. Um, yes, we're seeing, you know, sort of like a second wave in the whole COVID situation, but we don't expect to see, um, you know, economic restrictions or lockdowns in the in the wise of what we saw uh, during the first bout. So we think that the economy is likely to remain resilient, um, you know, going forward. And, uh, bankers have complained that the frequent CRR debit has been impacting on their ability to plan and also increased lending. And some also believe this is another move to curtail demand for FX. Uh, what's your view on this? I, I think the whole FX situation is um, one that has become somewhat complicated in you know, the way and the approach that the Apex Bank has chosen to manage it. Uh, suffice it to say that it's a, it's a very difficult situation um, you know, for the Apex Bank. Uh, we've seen the adjustments that we saw last year in terms of uh, that official rates, uh, essentially trying to align it with the, um, you know, the investor and exporter windows rates, uh, so trying to create some sort of semblance of a convergence, you know, within that market, you know. So uh, it really remains to be seen in terms of, um, you know, policy forward guidance, what the Apex Bank will do. Uh, recall that... Um, you know, the last set of, um, you know, uh, policy meetings we had, uh, the bank wasn't quite forthcoming in terms of what it would do. I think that, um, you know, the move that we've seen in crude oil prices um, would act to sort of provide, um, you know, some support uh, on that, uh, you know, foreign exchange leg, you know, going forward. But again, that angle still remains quite volatile because it's significantly susceptible to um, international shocks that could create, um, you know, serious vulnerabilities again on the home front. Now, whatever outcome we're likely to see uh, today, how do you expect um, investors to react to it? Well, I, I think that um, what we're likely to see, you know, maintenance of status quo, I, I think that the committee would uh, want to see, if you will, uh, you know, the impact of a number of the policy initiatives that had put in place towards the end of last year to sort of assess uh, and get a feel for where things are headed before it, um, you know, looks to deploy whatever monetary policy tool that it might deem fit uh, to try and control the situation. I still believe that the major focus for the committee at this time is um, you know output growth and maintaining policy uh, uh, you know uh, a stance that would um, continue to support um, general macro recovery in the economy. All right, uh, thank you, Victor Alui, head portfolio uh, man for management me. at uh, Commercial Partners. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, Updex's <laughs> commodities market update. Uh, we'll take a break now. When we come back, do stay with us. Well, we're being joined by Daminola Akimbami, Head of Research at Financial Derivatives um, a Company for the Commodities Market um, Update. Good morning, Dami. Um, have morning, we Chilezi. seen today? Uh, have we seen this year? This year, no. Happy New <laughs> but Year. But we've, we've spoken, actually. Yes, yeah, but Happy New Year. I wish you the same. Happy New Year to you, too. Right. Okay. Now, the first MPC meeting, of course, for the year is underway. FDC, um, just like many other um, economic analysts, uh, the position of status quo. Yes. And uh, we listened to uh, our first um, speaker who talked about output, the central bank focusing on output. Uh, however, we've seen that um, agriculture output continued to drop despite some of the interventions that the central bank had done as the anchor borrowing and all of that. So, on what basis are we going to have this status quo as it is, considering the spike on inflation? Yes, so um, why we are assuming um, a status quo would be maintained in the first meeting is because, one, it's, it is the first meeting of this year, and a lot of um, policy initiatives have been released by the central bank. And the central bank, at least um, sometime last year, was quoted to state that um, what is driving inflation right now is more structural than anything else. And if you look at the dynamics of um, the consumer price um, movement in Nigeria in 2020, 
we had a lot of supply um, chain disruptions. We had a lot of insecurity in the food producing belt, which affected agricultural output. And that's why we saw food inflation spike to um, about 19% even at the end of um, the year in December. And so these are some of the factors that have played into um, the consumer price movement. And bear in mind that we've had some economic reforms, which the government sort of like showing some level of commitment, and I'm referring to the fuel price deregulation. I'm talking about electricity tariffs. So all these have contributed to that price increase. However, because of low demand, because of declining disposable income, that to an extent has tapered um, the, 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 the percentage change in consumer prices. And we know that in December, the federal government opened some of the borders. So that should um, boost or increase um, supply in the market. And if you look at January this month, this is um, typically in January, there's that lull in economic activities, there's reduced spending. So that coupled with low demand would definitely have some impact on prices. But, and we're already seeing some commodity prices decline. For instance, rice, the price of rice has declined to about 27,000 um, naira per bag, to a basket of tomatoes, pepper, too. We're already seeing that decline in prices. But then again, Inflationary pressures are still high. We're going to see inflation remain elevated. And that this is going to be a major consideration for the Monetary Policy Committee at his meeting. The inflation rate. Uh, uh, Fitch also talked about government debt uh, funded by the CBN mm -hmm. uh, is stoking inflation. What's your take on that? Yes, yeah, so what they're talking about is um, ways and means advances. That's uh -huh. another way to fund the government debt. So basically the CBN is printing more money. And if you're printing more money, that's a demand pool um, factor that increases inflation. Mm -hmm. But I think that, the, the, yes, to an extent, it has impacted money supply. Mm -hmm. But I think, like I said earlier, the, the major factors are still more supply chain driven. We, we know that even during the period of um, the third, or right, we're still having that right now play out, yeah. the third Milan bridge closure, how that has affected logistics and even moving goods from the farmland to the market. So mm -hmm. all these have contributed to higher prices. And the fact that even the exchange rate was devalued at least twice last year, and we mm -hmm. have a very high import dependence in this country. So definitely most of all our raw materials are imported, the equipment we use are imported. So the imported inflation has increased and that also has contributed to the price increase. So yes, ways and means advances have contributed to a money supply increase, but mm -hmm. I don't think that has been a major driving factor. And we know that the federal government has said is going to securitize its debt, and mm -hmm. that is about 11 trillion naira. So basically what you're doing is selling more securities and you're mopping um, liquidity. So that to an extent will address Naira liquidity in the system and push interest rates up. Right, the guest we talked to um, yesterday uh, about this particular issue was of the view that uh, when we look at um, the downside or the downward trajectory of the agri output is not, yeah, agree that it's not basically the fault of the central bank or mm. whatever it's doing, that it's because the banks are not lending and that if the banks should lend, um, okay, uh, then we have uh, more output there. But then how would the banks be able to lend when the central bank keep taking up the CRR and with the, you know, the, the rate we have, the CRR at the moment? I think that's a good point. If you look at um, what the agricultural sector accounts for in terms of banking sector credit to the private um, sector, it accounts for about 4%, 5% there about compared to manufacturing and oil and gas, which account for the, the most. And so that just shows you that the banking sector is more exposed to the oil and gas sector. And obviously, banks would lend to where they know that they can get as much returns for, um, at least, and again, payment for their, for their credit and what have you. And if you look at what is also happening in the agri sector, yes, we've seen increased intervention by the central bank with respect to its ANCO and Boras program, even um, packages and initiatives from the federal government. We know that if we even look at cocoa, for instance, now, the government has been able to invest in high-yielding cocoa varieties just to boost um, cocoa supply. Well, we also know that even it's trying to rehabilitate cocoa firms and also develop like a 2,000 um, hectare model firm just basically to boost output and um, yield. So mm. all this with the government plus the CBN, they are doing a lot of things to try and and grow the output from the agricultural sector. You also need the banking sector because obviously you, one major issue that manufacturers, small medium um, enterprises face is the availability of credit and also at what rate. And this definitely has impacted mm. on the performance of the agri sector. Okay, so the, the CBN has continued to emphasize on uh, remittance uh, policy. Yes. Uh, with a view to increase FX 
uh, inflow into Nigeria. One of your burning economic issues says Naira falls in the parallel market mm -hmm. as IMTOs face uh, penalties on diaspora flows. Why, why is that? So one of the um, recent policy initiatives that the CBN um, released what has been penalizing international um, money transfer operators, yeah. those that are not remitting um, diaspora um, flows. So in we know that um, sometime in 2020, there was a circular that was released ordering or instructing IMTOs to pay um, recipients of yeah. diaspora funds yeah. in yeah. Naira, yeah. then it reversed that stance yeah. to insist that they pay in dollars. Yeah. And even recently, the CBN has released a circular stating that um, exporters that do not um, remit their proceeds at the IFX window will be barred from banking services. So mm -hmm. all this is just basically trying, the CBN is trying to boost liquidity at the I, I and E window. And we know that right now, if you look at the average turnover so far in January, it has dropped by almost 79% to about 58, 59 million dollars. If you compare that to what it was this time last year, yeah. this time last year was over 200, almost 20 million dollars. So you can see that there's, there's a liquidity dirt, mm. and that is what is affecting um, the exchange rate. And that's why we are seeing the central bank trying to st um, boost liquidity at the I and E window, basically mm. to try and move demand from the parallel market to the I and E window. Because if that happens, then if there's reduced demand at the parallel market, that should um, allow the parallel market appreciate well, it kind of them. feels like the IMTOs prefer to actually pay in Naira. Well, you can't, you can't blame them if you, if you were given the option of getting or of, of changing your dollars yeah. at 394, which is the I and E window, mm -hmm. and 475. Mm -hmm. I mean, definitely you would go for the one that pays you more. So th that's why we're seeing that happen right. with, the I and I am with the IMTOs right now. But the central bank is trying to stimulate or to increase dollar liquidity mm -hmm. because we know that one, all prices, which is where we get most of our forex um, earnings from, all mm. prices have been quite volatile. Mm. And we know that diaspora remittances to have dropped because of the COVID impact, which mm. has affected employment levels in developed countries. So every opportunity to just try and support the currency, boost external reserves, is what the CBN is trying to do. Sure. Okay, that brings us to what the central bank governor said at the last um, MPC meeting mm. about this um, parallel market. Let's, mm. let's take a listen there. Yeah. Parallel market, as far as we know it, and the data that we have, is a shallow market in Nigeria with no more than 5% of market share. Parallel market, and quote me, is a tainted market in Nigeria where people who desire to deal in illegal foreign exchange transactions, including sourcing of FX cash for purposes of offering bribes, Corruption, that is where they deal. How would you react to this? I mean, if this is the case for parallel markets, why do we have them? Okay, so a unique feature of um, the forex market in developing economies is the coexistence of the parallel market and the official market. And some of the features or characteristics of a parallel market is where you have capital controls, where you have capital controls uh, operate existing in the, in, the for, in the forex market, where there's information asymmetry, where there are a lot of restrictions. So, and we know that that basically is what is playing out in the Nigerian forex market. And right now, like I mentioned earlier, that like, what the CBN is trying to do is reduce the demand at the power market so that um, you see more transactions being carried out at the I and E window. Well, because of the dollar um, illiquidity going on right now, a lot of manufacturers have been forced to source for their dollars or meet their dollar demand elsewhere. And if that means them going to the power market, you would see that happen. And we've seen a blended rate occur. So a lot of manufacturers are combining both the I and E window rate plus the power market rate just so as to meet, make ends meet. So uh, about criminals and what have you operating at the power market, obviously yeah. because that market is not regulated, That's obviously, true. so it's, it's open, it's, it's, it's subject to all sorts of things. But because of the issue of dollar illiquidity, that has pushed a lot of manufacturers, a lot of legitimate transactions to the power market. And as long as we have that uncertainty, as long as we still have forex scarcity, we are going to see that power market rate um, or that power market fully functional. We're looking at this, uh, the policy barring exporters uh, with unrepatriated services mm. from uh, banking services. How would this affect the commodities market? 
Yeah, so because of the import dependence, uh, yeah. the, we have a very high import content. So what what CBN is trying to say, like I mentioned earlier, if we can move transactions to the I and E window, mm. and basically even the CBN is already even hinting at the possibility of another adjustment, especially at the I and E window. Okay. You will notice at the end of December, December 31st to be precise, we mm. saw a sharp movement from 393 to 410 at the I and E window, although you, you appreciate the back this year to about 393. So there's that possibility that we could see the I and E window move towards 400, 410. And what that should lead to the power market is an appreciation of the power market rate. And in the short term, yes, because of the import content, we might see imported inflation continue to increase. But if all prices at least at $55 per barrel, mm. if we can boost our cocoa export earnings, if we have more diaspora remittances as the global economy recovers, we expect to see a pickup in our external reserves. We expect to see more um, support from the CBN in terms mm. of stabilizing the exchange rate. And that would feed positively into commodity prices. Okay, let's um, still look at um, some of the items that you have on your burning economic issues. Um, you talked about Cameroon rice output up 40% by 2023 new techniques to improve harvest how will this impact uh, nigeria particularly uh, with the ban on importation of rice so you know cameroon is one of nigeria's um, neighbors and obviously with the, the fact that cameroon is using new um, technology and new varieties to boost its output there's a possibility that this one could also be included or incorporated even in nigeria and there's also the risk of smuggling, at least with, now that some of the borders are open, there's mm. that risk that um, of, of rice being smuggled into Nigeria. And bear in mind that what Cameroon is doing is basically trying to reduce its rice import. So definitely there's that incentive if, they can, if rice in Cameroon is cheaper and whatever, you could see that smuggling, being smuggled into mm. Nigeria. But then again, there's also a lesson to be learned with that technology that they're using to boost the output and their yield. Is it something that we too can reciprocate mm in Nigeria to boost our output and yield. All right, uh, take us through the domestic commodity price uh, movement and their drivers, because uh, we see cement price stabilizing as the hamatan kicks mm -hmm. in. Yeah, so you know, typically around um, the dry season, so yeah. that's usually December, January, maybe into February, we see a lot of renovation, a lot of um, building, um, construction works going on, and that's because, of, because it's dry season. So typically mm. the demand for c um, cement increases at that point in time, which should lead to a price increase. But we're not seeing that yet. So it's just, um, it's just coincidental that cement prices are stable right now. But if the amatan persists and the demand for cement increases because of increased innovation, building constructions and whatnot, it would factor into cement prices. prices. Okay, Dami, thank you very much. We'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chimizi. Thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> we take a moment and we'll be back. And at the equities market, the bull is back. But Eddie, will it stay? Well, Chimmy, I do not know if it will stay, but, you know, fingers crossed and we hope that that would stay uh, in the market. Now, we saw gains in the market yesterday after four negative trading sessions last week. The Ocean Index was up 0.21% to 41,088.96 points, while the equity cap was at 21.494 trillion naira. Now, Activity level was lower compared to Friday's session. We saw about 333.09 million units worth 2.64 billion are traded in over 5,600 deals. Well, let's talk to Abdul Rashid Momo, a stockbroker at TRW Stockbrokers, for more on the trading day. Good morning, Mr. Momo. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. Good morning. Now, with all eyes on the MPC meeting, I mean, we're going to be having a program later and we'll find out what decisions that they make. What are traders expecting from this meeting and how do you think, you know, it will shape trading today? Um, I think definitely that is what people are actually looking for, is uh, what the rates are going to be at the end of the day, is the if CBN holds that rates, uh, then that will give us a brighter, a clearer view of the outlook for the year 2021. Um, if you notice, market has just been range bound, right? The beginners and the other, it, it's trading within a very tight bound, um, band now. So what that means is that any, what comes out from the, from the meeting will determine the next um, spike, and I think the spike is going to be is going to be huge, either 
up or down. But for now, I think we should look more of the upside because um, the earning season is still around the corner. And with um, their slick use financial videos, um, we reported in that special of year end, we still know uh, there's still a very bright, um, bright light at the end of the tunnel. Yesterday in the markets, Dangote Cement and Etel Africa were one of the, you know, the major drivers. For Dangote Cement, we know that last week that stock took a beating. So clearly investors were just taking advantage of the lower prices. But what would you say drove sentiment for Etel Africa? Etel Africa, one thing about Etel Africa is that um, when it comes to liquidity, liquidity, it's not, um, how would I put it? Um, XL Africa is also that you know they are listed um, in another exchange, so we we see more of what they call um, what's the word? Um, I think um, dual listing where pricing are done both ways. I think it was the best stock which was done this year. So it made about a hundred percent from um, four hundred to about eight hundred and fifty-five naira. These stocks for me are used in um, balancing. We, we are used as buffers for the index. Um, I wouldn't know how to explain it, but in terms of market making, um, the way the market works, we have some stocks that are used in the, if we are in the downtrend, these stocks are used to hold the market because when they breach, everybody that is pulled. And basically, when they drop, we use the other um, stocks, like the other banks, like the, let's say the Nigerian Bulls, the GTD, and the Zenith to act. All these are just balancing of the market in terms of in expression of what um, results will come out at the end of the day from CBN after their um, MP, MP meeting. So it's a technical thing to explain, but most of these things are just used in balancing the stocks, uh, balancing the market. The bottom line is that we are still in a bull trend. Let's find sure that we are seeing some profit taking along that we are still in a bull trend. It's after when those year ends come out from the banks and from the companies, then we now start to look at marketing and another way. So for right, me, um, people still getting out, um, I'm sorry to say, they're still, they're, we are still in a bull run. I right, would we'll love to hear that. But thank you so much for your input on the program, Mr. Momo. Abdurashid Momo is a stockbroker at TRW Stockbroker. So, Chimmy, I'm sure you were glad to hear that, you know, the market is still in a bull run. I will hold on to that. Well, let's see how that goes after the decision uh, announcement today. And just as he said, uh, the earnings season, of course, um, has started. All right, um, we'll take a break, and then when we come back, we'll check with Juliana on what's happening in London. And for updates from London, let's talk to Juliana. Hello, Juliana. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Hi, laddie. Yeah, so London woke up to news that the UK's unemployment rate rose to 5% in three months to November, up from 4.9%. That's the first time it's been that high in more than four years. Do you see this uh, data forcing the Chancellor to extend the job a job retention scheme and uh, other support measures beyond the spring? It's a really good question, uh, Laddie, and I think it's a, a call that uh, Chancellor Rishi Shinak is going to find it really difficult to avoid over the next coming days. As you said, uh, UK unemployment has risen to 5% mm. in the three months to November, up from 4.9%. If you look at those figures, I've got to say, historically, internationally, still doing OK. And I think that is because of the job retention scheme. And to remind our viewers, just in case they needed reminding, the British government have basically been paying people to stay at home. It's been heralded as the uh, the best scheme uh, that we've managed to put through during the coronavirus crisis. There have been threats and warnings of it stopping on several different occasions. But the Chancellor has, uh, he initially extended it till March. Now he's extended it to April. But because of the success of the inoculation of our citizens, I think 
nearly 7 million people have received the jab so far. Mm. There are um, uh, uh, some calls, particularly from the opposition Labour Party, asking uh, the Conservative government to, to keep people in jobs just so we can uh, see through this uh, winter period through to the spring and perhaps even to the summer. No surprises that the hospitality sector has been the worst off, uh, followed shortly by travel and leisure and, of course, retail. We also know from the Office for National Statistics from this data that those aged between 16 to 24 are the worst off. And so all encompassing, it does show that 1.72 million people in the UK are mm. currently out of work. And since the start of the pandemic, which can you believe it, is almost a year ago now, 828,000 people have lost their jobs. Another thing to point out and an issue we do have in this country with some of this data is that obviously we're looking in the rearview mirror. This January lockdown is really, really tough. It's the third national lockdown. And these statistics are only looking at the three months till November. And of course, as we know, if, even if we look at what's happened with Debenhams and yeah. um, the Arcadia Group, tens of thousands of jobs have already been lost during that time. So yeah. if we're going to what uh, the Andrew, Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England governor predicts, uh, unemployment in this country is probably between 6.5 to 7 percent as of yeah. today. Wow. OK, we'll see how he responds to that. And on the earnings front, the world's largest wealth manager, UBS, has reported a net income of $1.71 billion uh, for the fourth quarter of 2020 and a 137% jump uh, of the uh, year before. Now, is that being, uh, how is it being traded uh, this morning? Uh, well, I've got to tell you, you know, this is this is definitely a story for the elite, the elite of the elite, the 0.1 of the 0.1 percent. But UBS is doing really well. And I suppose it is an important story because, you know, they are the first major bank to kick off the earnings seasons. We're going to get a flurry of these trading updates over the next couple of months uh, from Europe. And uh, UBS are doing very, very well. They're doing particularly well in the Asia Pacific region where, you know, looking after um, the very wealthy's wealth um, is very, very lucrative in that region. They have shown that profits um, have skyrocketed by 173% in the final quarter of 2020, when if you look at most nations and most sectors around the world, they were doing pretty badly. But, you know, looking after people's wealth was doing very well. The firm have also announced that this morning, because they are doing so well, they plan on boosting shareholders' revenue by buying back a whooping 4.5% billion dollars worth of shares. Now, they do have a CEO, a new CEO, Ralph Hamers. He actually released a statement on the back of um, this trading report. He said, our strong 2020 results clearly demonstrate the true strength of our franchise. It was a challenging year for our clients um, and for our colleagues. We stood for stability, maintained connectivity and provided the advice and solutions in our clients need. Their shares were up about 2% when they announced these results. Although, as we are seeing from everybody at the moment, they are still being pretty cautious cautious about travel restrictions and the race for vaccinations. The war of the vaccines, as it's starting to become now, um, could become a little bit tricky uh, for investors over the next couple of months. OK. And, and the, in the US, uh, Janet Yellen has been confirmed as the first ever uh, female US Treasury Secretary and a state voter. When she headed the Fed, she, her focus was on employment and uh, rather than inflation, and this gave her a reputation for favoring low interest rates. Uh, how are investors in the UK viewing Yellen as US Treasury Secretary? Well, it's an amazing story, isn't it? And I think uh, I'll use the words of Democratic Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who said that she's got a breathtaking range of experience. And I think as well, one thing Janet Yellen is clearly able to do is to make complicated economic policies uh, palatable and understandable. Didn't really get much reaction um, in the UK this morning. The FTSE, by the way, opened up pretty positively, even though we've seen those pretty negative unemployment figures. And I think that's because really it was last week the main focus was on uh, during her confirmation hearing in the Senate where she did say that, look, you know, we can't uh, be too tight with fiscal stimulus. We've got to put that $1.92 trillion uh, back into the economy. Uh, we've got to tackle unemployment. We've got to raise taxes. Obviously, this raised a few eyebrows uh, from the Republicans. But I think, you know, Janet Yellen is a very, very experienced uh, lady. And, uh, you know, she is going to be absolutely pivotal in shaping 
and managing uh, Joe Biden's economic policies. And obviously, because it is the world's largest economy, Britain will have all eyes and ears focusing and looking at what she's going to be doing. But I think for the entire world, you know, getting this stimulus package finally through the Senate is what everybody is waiting for, not less than, uh, you know, the US citizens who are desperate to get their hands on that $1,400 uh, dollars each. Yeah. All right, Juliana, thanks for the update and do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. All right, Jimmy, I guess it's uh, girl power. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, of course. Yeah. And talking about that, Eddie, of course, is waiting for the debt and currency market update. Eddie. Well, the bond market sustained its bearish run yesterday, and that was due to sell pressure on the short end of the curve. We saw yields uh, rise by about 14 basis points. Now, it's still expected that uh, investors will trade cautiously. You know, everyone's still waiting uh, to know what the MPC would decide. And speaking about that, you know, let's talk to Rama Baba, the chief dealer of fixed income at FBN Quest Merchant Bank. Good morning, Rama. Thank you for joining us on the program. Good morning, Eddie. I'm sure you're also one of those eagerly waiting to hear what the CBN would decide later today. So what are your expectations and how will that shape trading today? Um, okay, so general expectation in the market is that since this is the fourth MPC meeting of the year, we really do not expect any major change. Actually, we actually expect the um, MPC to maintain the status quo. How would that ship trade in? Truth of the matter is, since the bond auction last week, where the DMO caught um, the stop rate higher than expected, we've seen market um, yields trending higher as the day goes by. Also, another thing that has um, caused the market yields to go higher is because of the liquidity squeeze in the system last week. The CBN debited over $300 billion for CRR. There was the FX debit, and then again, the debit for the bond sale. So market was pretty tight last week. However, to be honest, this week, we expect a bit of respite to come into the market as um, FAC funds hit the system. There are almost maturities today. And then again, we also expect coupon payments on about two or three bonds this week. So a bit of liquidity should come into the market. Um, that doesn't mean market um, direction should actually reverse, but um, the northward movement in yield may be a bit muted or something this week. All right, Ramat, thank you for your input on the program. Ramat Baba is the chief dealer of fixed income at FBN Quest Merchant Bank. Well, Jimmy, all eyes are on the MPC, so we'll wait to hear what happens later today. Status quo, status quo, status quo. That's what everybody <laughs> seems to be saying. Anyway, by one. Two o'clock precisely, that's oh, when no. the central bank governor will be briefing. But of course, we'll start that conversation by 1.30 uh, here on studio. That should be during our launch program, Business Incorporated. So keep it with us. Um, in the meantime, let's check in with um, the crypto. Yeah. Is it a world of its own? What's yeah. happening there? Like? Well, Bitcoin still ranging between uh, 31,000, 34,000, but it's down today. Uh, Investors are still looking at the Ethereum uh, getting back um, to its all-time high and surpassing. Some Alt are claiming... Your altcoins seem to be the one raining now. The altcoins are in the red today, so, <laughs> yeah, it remains to be seen. <laughs> All right, thanks, Ladi. Yeah. Okay, that's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimeze Ubi Iwago. And I'm Ladi Williams. Thank you for watching.